All right, so welcome to formulation and solution of geosystems engineering pro problems again. So first thing that we will do is we will discuss a uh, syllabus that you have uh, in front of yourself. So I will just quickly uh, go over it. And I should actually probably show it on the screen as we walk through it. And we will really just highlight some important parts. Okay. So first and foremost, my name is Masha Brodanic, uh, and you can find me on fourth floor in 4186. And teaching assistant is sitting here at the time, uh, Ming Yu Wang. So he's a graduate student uh, of mine. So he will, both of us will have office hours. So this is sort of first thing that we should figure out. Do you all have a class at 10 o'clock right after this class? You do. Okay, so there's at least three. So probably then the office hours that I pick for myself are not a good option. Would 11 o'clock be better? No. Uh, 11, noon, <laughs> let's go down. Noon is better, noon to one on Wednesday. So at least on Wednesday, we're gonna put noon. Uh, I do often have to have lunch meetings, so I'm gonna find a different time on Wednesday. And then let's say Friday, uh, I am teaching another class, one, two, three, two, three, four. How about four to five on Friday? Or is that too late in general on Friday? That's too late on Friday. You're out of here on Friday. Okay, so let's see. Maybe we can do Monday, four to five. Would that be better? All right. Okay. Monday. And in general, you can make an appointment. And then Ningyu has found office hours uh, with, with his schedule to be 3 to 4.30 on Tuesday, Thursday. This is having in mind that your homework is going to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so Tuesday, Thursday, you can have multiple questions. And he's the one grading the homework. <laughs> yes? No. Okay, so this works. And this is going to be in a third floor student lounge. I, I think that level room, that is special room for office hours, is scheduled uh, for that, uh, but it'll be a table next to it somewhere, somewhere third floor office. Yeah. All right, so that makes the most important part here are introductions and so basically let me just highlight so this is now changed please fix the syllabus you have in hand especially these uh, office hours of mine have changed now before we proceed since we are actually a small class i haven't taught an undergraduate class this so this is going to be a little verbal better than I can in a class of 80. So let's just get, do a quick round of introductions here. So how about we start over here? Uh, my name is Juan Miguel. I'm a sophomore. Okay. Uh, um, today, can you read the sophomore teacher Okay. As Moriela, Houston, I'm a sophomore teacher Okay. I'm Justin. I'm a senior journalism major. <laughs> <laughs> It's, yeah, in, in the computational science and engineering. So there we go. So this is what this class is all about. You're welcome. Sweet. So we will hang out with the drawing engineers. <laughs> so <laughs> so right. you will figure out, in the, I guess you will write about it. As a journalist, you have to write about something. All right. I'm 
Victor and Sophomore. Uh, Victor Junior, uh, Sophomore. 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 Well then, let's move on. So the objectives of this course that we're going to actually go over uh, during the introduction, but we will learn about numerical methods, about algorithms, how to solve problems, uh, mathematical or physical problems using a computer, as opposed to working out an analytical solution on paper. So basically, uh, while some of the math and physics classes are prerequisite for this class, in general, you do not need to know how to solve the problem by hand. Like, for instance, a differential equation, you figure out the solution that is analytical, because we will learn how to do it in the computer. Okay. You will actually realize that more often than not, you're very good at posing problems and forming equations, but the analytical solution, the one that you can actually find the functional relationships that solve the problem, don't exist. They can exist in maybe one or two percent of cases. In all others, you have to have to employ computers to uh, find the solution, and this is why this is uh, this class is uh, important. Now, the textbook is set in here is Applied Numerical Methods with MATLAB. MATLAB is a sort of a software environment that we're going to use, though the environment in itself is not really an, an important thing. What we learned here is sort of can be translated to the entire environment because certain elements are the same throughout them. Um, it is optional, so you don't have to uh, buy the textbook. Materials provided in class uh, should be enough. However, if you like a printed copy, you can find that one. You don't have to find the most, the latest edition. Whatever we are going to cover in this course exists basically in all of the editions. So it doesn't have to be the latest one. What really changes slightly is that authors add two or three advanced chapters that we don't get to see in the rest of the class anyway. Uh, and also they change up some problems in the back. But for the general uh, purposes, any addition of the textbook is fine. So moving on, uh, I will be posting everything on Canvas. I haven't posted syllabus, but that's going to be the first thing I do once I uh, get out of this class. And I will record lectures, uh, which is what I'm doing right now, using a screen capturing software. And I will post them on YouTube. Uh, it will probably take you half of a semester to get my name right and how to spell. Uh, but actually, once you do, I'm the only one out there with that name. So if you find me on YouTube, it's probably me. <laughs> so there is benefits. And <laughs> I cannot easily hide, actually, as long as you can uh, type in my name right. Okay? So in that sense, it should be relatively easy to find, even if you can't uh, figure out uh, where, is, where is the link that I posted. Okay? Now we will get to the hardware and software. You are uh, not for this very moment, but basically starting second week or so, uh, I will tell you precisely when you will be expected to bring a computer. Is that a problem? I mean, this class could be posted in the uh, in the 
in the upstairs in the computer room, but I found it that it's easier if you actually carry, it's your own working computer, you're required to have one anyway. Um, it, it's easier to just have everything in your computer as you go. If you really have to uh, share a laptop during the class time, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, however, here and there, we will have actually assignments that you will be required to post. So in that case, you just finish them up on your own computer, your own, uh, computer link. So that should not be a problem if you here and there have to share a computer. Just let me know. Okay. Now, exam times, again, is something. So right now, uh, I set the times as Wednesday, 7th of March, and Wednesday, 17th of April as the exam times. I know that this is right now something that is really far away, but I would have to ask you to check your schedules because we don't want a situation of having two exams at the same time. So one question before I actually find the room for the exam. Uh, we are small, class small enough that we can actually have exams in this room to do that, which is not often the case in the classes library. Now, one option is to have those exams bright and early in the morning. I can make them tailor them to the hour and a half, so make them like 8.30. So instead of starting at 9, you start at 8.30, 8.30 till 10 you're done and over with an exam, is that something that you would be open to? Another option, no, <laughs> too early. Another option is to do it in the evening. So I would likely schedule this room for like 6 o'clock in the evening and wake up. Is that, is that something that is, let's do show of hands. What works better with your biorhythm, should I say? <laughs> 8.30 till 10 in the morning or 6 p.m. onwards? 6, 6 in the morning. We have one morning person. I have a class at 8. Oh, you have a class at 8. Well, that kicks it out. Uh, okay, problem solved. There's a class at 8. Your schedule this semester is <laughs> full force, 6 to 9, and then you can't recover. You have to continue 9 to 10. All right, so well, that solves it, then we can't do a morning. So I will find a room for six o'clock, probably this room. We'll see. And our final right now, the schedule is it's Monday, uh, 14th of May at 9 a.m. Okay. In terms of homework, there will be approximately eight to nine homework assignments, and each needs to be completed with a week. Uh, Ning Yu is grading your assignments, so when you have a trouble with the first of the ten, and then uh, if you can't resolve the dispute with <laughs> you, then it comes to me. The way I rule is that TAs have freedom to come up with how they grade and how much points, how many points they give to the class. However, what they don't have uh, the freedom to do is be unfair. So as long as they grade harshly but fairly, that's fine by me. But if it's something is unfair or you think that somebody else is grading differently, then that's when you can get to them. Okay. So that's uh, sort of the rule. I don't know. Ming Yu, are you a harsh grader? Kind of. Kind of? So in the middle? Now, you have to also consider TA's background. Uh, when you know that, uh, a lot of people coming from Tsinghua University uh, are very harsh graders because they were graded harshly. <laughs> so, so however he grades you is what he learned at his own university. It was kind of zero or one, right? I don't get 100 points on it. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just, that's, but that's, that was, uh, that's sort of like how it uh, comes about, how harsh graders come about. It's typically because they were graded harshly themselves. So in uh, any event, and then there will be a computational project near the end of the class that will count as two homework assignments and you will get two uh, weeks to complete it. Okay? Now, in terms of class and out of class participation, you're supposed to, you're expected to be in class. Um, and there will be some reading and viewing assignments that I will give before the class so we can use the time in class for your questions and starting to work on 
And if that goes well, I really will consider like starting to work on homework sets in class so you can kind of go through them uh, quicker. But that means that basically you should really view or read whatever I sent you so you can actually formulate your questions. And even if you, all you get by reading is get confused, that's good. That starts you on the learning path. That makes you come to class with questions and we can start building your questions. And we are a small class, so there's no problem covering everybody's questions so that should actually come through a lot. Yeah. So uh, please uh, respond to these. And ultimately you spend the similar time, you spend your time better. Yeah. Because you will ultimately have to sit down and read the same thing anyway, not really <laughs> read, uh, working through the homework or work, uh, working towards uh, an exam. So if you start your questions sooner, you're actually going to speed up your learning process and you will learn better and you will retain the information better. Yeah. So in general, whenever you're working, this is there will be a lot of coding. And a lot of these problems, let's put it this way, they exist solved somewhere online or somewhere in your brains. We're not inventing, we're reinventing hot water here. This is introduction to numerical methods and numer numerical methods have been around for quite a while. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be working on them yourself just because they exist solved. Because you want to form a way or of attacking a problem and solving a problem so that once you're actually coded with a, a new problem, you know how to approach it. So this is sort of a training session. So please uh, take that into consideration. So even if you're working with somebody else, try to form those questions first yourself. So first try to attack the problem yourself. At least you have your first question on your own before you go to somebody to show them. So that's in general uh, just a better approach to learning. Grading will be 20% homework and projects, 10% quizzes. Now any quizzes, there will be some unannounced five minute quizzes in class. Um, and uh, there will also often be whatever we're working on in the class, you were supposed to, you will complete and post by the end of the day. So that will count as a quiz as well. So it's sort of like a participation quiz. And then there will be 20% exam 1, 25 uh, exam 2, and 25 final exam. And I hope the total here comes out to 100%. Um, I do the standard grading scheme of B, C minus, C, C plus, and so forth, all the way to A. And in general, um, there will be no makeups, makeup exams, uh, but of course, if there's an emergency of some sort, then you have to work with me uh, immediately uh, as we go along. So I also expect you to check your schedule against any cold days or anything that you know that, that are excused, absence that you know in advance, so we can uh, have the time that is uh, working for everybody. This is a relatively small class. And the rest are the standard one. Um, this is, I'm going to reiterate. Well, actually, I have some slides on it, so I'm going to reiterate as I uh, get in the slide. And finally, in terms of dispute, uh, if you're disputing a homework or how, it's, how the quiz or homework are graded, first go to me usually, and then come to me. All of the disputes should be done within a week of the teacher. So don't be at the last class, last week of the class, suddenly review all of your homework and realize, oh my god, I could have gotten five more points with homework two. By the end of the class, disputing homework two, too late. There's a very practical reason for that. It's called human memory. When I'm grading, or when you use grading, have in my mind, even if I write notes, how I graded and I'm attempting to be fair for the entire class. I have that in my brain for about a week or so, maybe two weeks if you push me. But after that, 
I don't know how I graded the rest of the class for this. So yes, if you take it out of context and come to me two months later, I'll be like, yeah, but maybe, yeah, maybe you can put five points more, maybe you can get actually five points less. Because I would be at that point changing the grading scheme in my system and basically give you uh, your extra or the deal. I, I always reserve the right to uh, take some points as well. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, based on some sort of memory, which is becoming a point of memory. So please do that within a week in order to give that. <coughs> and then Again, attendance is mandatory, of course, if you know that you will be absent, sometimes an interview comes up or something that you already have planned in advance, or let me know in advance. So sending an email works. Okay, so if a quiz shows up during the day, then that quiz is simply taking you out of, and out of consideration. Do you have any questions before? And then for special needs, uh, I can make any adjustments that are needed uh, for the class. Recording a lecture, I guess, already helps. It helps everybody, but it helps in that regard. If there's anything else that I can do, please let me know. And dropping a course. And finally, feedback. There is actually a form that I'm going to exemplify. So this is a feedback form. This is the link that is provided in the slides that I'm going to post as well as the syllabus. So essentially, you would type in any feedback and comment that you have here. So so it could be something like this, and you click submit. Okay. You can edit your sub, uh, response or submit another. And I will now show you what I see on the other end. This is Google Forms, by the way. Uh, it's kind of a very useful tool. You can easily create a fo form on your own. So what I see, I have quite a number. And this is the form that I use for class in general. I can see it in the form of a spreadsheet. So, this is what I see. Hello, good morning. Okay. This is what we have. These were the questions, obviously, before uh, some, I gave a practice test before one of the exam. So there was a question, do we need to know how to do question 1G, the practice exam that was posted, okay? So what's key about this is that it's anonymous. If for some reason you don't want to sign your name, I will not know who posed the question, but it will still alert me to something that you don't know and you write that down. I often find out that way, which is a most difficult question I gave in the homework. <laughs> Though I don't, I really don't mind if you do identify yourself, um, but I know I don't, which, who you are, if you have a problem with it, it doesn't really matter ultimately. So feel free to write a name. If you actually just simply write a name, my name is so-and-so, that's fine as well. So do as you please. You can email me, you can talk to me, you can walk into the office, you can use anonymous form. Whatever form of communication suits you the best, please use it. Um, but this is kind of very useful, especially when you need to review things. Okay. So the most important thing is all I see is the timestamp. And typically when I find enough responses here, oh, please, we haven't had enough time. So you all individually post that you didn't have enough time to complete the homework, and I find enough of those responses that I'll, I will simply so I'm using it as some sort of cumulative tool on communication. Questions? Very silent class, but it is a morning class.
So let me go back to my PowerPoint. I have some So we have gone through. So just to uh, resolve something uh, about my name, you will see different spellings of my first name. My first name is Masha in the essay, but that S has something about it that is often taken away. So you will see M-A-S-A. -A. Sometimes I will put in an H in there, such as the one in my email address. So people say SH as opposed to Masa. Masa means a lot of things, but it's not my name. <laughs> so, and the problem with the, all of those things is that not all of them are positive. Masa in Croatian, I'm from Croatia, is mass. I don't know if it's called mass. Masa Karina is also the name of uh, Sophia. This, I know it's a thing. <laughs> There's apparently in Arabic, Masa means either green or something like that. It's kind of positive. <laughs> In my own language, it doesn't translate well, so whatever you do, please don't call me Masa. Masha is fine, Dr. Masha is fine, Dr. P is fine, if you don't want to pay me with my last name, which all people often do. Uh, don't want to, so you don't have to go into spelling Pradanovich, right? Dr. P is just fine. So whatever, wherever you're uh, comfortable, just please don't say Masa. Everything else is accepted. I respond to everything else. Have my website if you're interested in uh, what my research is about, and my email is masha at utexas.edu. <coughs> now, in terms of my educational background, I have a bachelor's in applied mathematics from the University of Zagreb. Zagreb is in Croatia, in Europe. Uh, I have a PhD in computational applied mathematics from State University of New York at Stony Brook. Um, and then I moved to Austin first as a postdoctoral fellow, then as a research associate, assistant professor, and now associate professor. All of these titles are probably shooting me by the head, <laughs> but they are important in uh, my professional life. Uh, for instance, the jump, these are the research positions where you don't teach, and then you start teaching, and after five years or so, you're evaluated and given tenure, and that's what the associate those are just some details here in academic life. Now my research interests are in flow and transport in porous media. Have you, uh, any of you already had class or transport phenomena? Okay, so we'll soon start, start in how, so basically we're either transporting momentum, which is essential flow, when I have different pressures, or mass, which are different a difference in concentrations, or heat, if I have difference in temperatures, today we are definitely feeling that one. <laughs> so essentially, you have a warm coffee cup, you release metals close to it, which is a different line on the heat transfer to blow you up. So basically, difference or differences or gradients are in certain properties, such as temperature, is what's causing the transfer. And study of transport is obviously very important everywhere. But not just flow, which is momentum transport, but also mass and heat transport. So it's one of the fundamental classes. What I do is I do a study of transport based on um, real images of rocks. So I hit rocks and their complicated geometry and figure out how the transport happens through the pores of rock as well as solid impact. And sometimes coupled. So there is a lot of uh, applications, such as sediment mechanics, fracturing, uh, and in youth, who works on something really cool, cool called ferrohydrodynamics, which happens if you throw in some paramagnetic nanoparticles into a flow, and then you can ask okay, what happens afterwards. But magnetic forces can add some uh, fun to the regular displacement of fluids in porous media. And then, of course, I'm interested in numerical methods that are designed to solve these problems, which is what I hope to do this <laughs> so Basically, there's different names. These are just different names for different uh, methods that solve different problems. All right. So teaching assistant is in you, as I uh, introduced him already. His email is ningyu 
www.utexas.edu. The rest of this I have already discussed. Oh, so I already reviewed this part. Now I'm going to repeat. This is just some of this is just to repeat important points. So in serious case, cases that need some time adjustments, please let me know. Uh, so this could be religious holidays, illness, disability. Let me know as soon as possible. Sometimes you have immediately something that you can do, like if there is an illness or something that you can give me uh, so that I can work towards a different class and a different uh, exam time. But if not, then just email me and we'll go from there. Okay. And I'm going to repeat on working on your own. It's important to at least start working on your own, even if you're working with somebody and discussing a solution with somebody, because you want to learn better. Ultimately, you have to show the master all the problems. So on exam, you're going to be working, uh, working on your own. Now, that said, there is also strict academic dishonesty rules. So cheating goes so far, and yes, you can actually go and get a better grade for cheating until you're caught. What happens when you're caught? Does anybody know? Let's say I catch that two of you submit completely the same form. What happens? Hmm? Yes, and then I can report to what happens if I can report to the other person. That's a little better. So everybody that ever asks for your transcript, let's see that. How does that get graded for you? What happens if that happens twice? Yes, it's been that way. And that has happened in this department. There was actually a case where I reported something five years ago or so, and independently another professor reported and then got kicked or suspended for semester, which could be that depending on the gravity of the situation, he had not come back at all. Is that part of the general education and teacher of that? Do you think so? I hope not. But in general, because the rules are strict. Now, yes, a lot can happen until you're caught. Okay? But if you do get caught, and one thing with code, trust me, it's really easy to copy. It's even easier to see than copy. There's no variation in handwriting. Okay? It's the copy, exact copy. So be careful. Be, be, be sure that whatever you submit, is you, you actually know how to do it. Even if you have consulted the solution that is good, you have worked for it and you know how to do it. Right? And you have the right. But there is a, there is a big difference. I mean, hot copy paste is the easiest operation. And for one, we actually do code it so we can copy okay? and execute the same code over and over. There's actually a purpose for copying. But when submitting problems in this class, you need to know how to do it, even if you consult it. So there's a big difference. It's a nuanced difference. The difference is, do you know what you wrote down and what you submit? And if you do, then it's over. All right, so again, working through the problems on your own is actually satisfactory, uh, but if you don't, do it, and if you copy, I will actually report, and I have in the past. Uh, we already mentioned dissolve disputes on time, and this is just so that you have this also in your uh, slides, which I will post the slides. Here's an anonymous feedback form that you can use. You can talk to me, email me, uh, whatever works for you the best. All right, so in the right reminder of this class, I'm going to start sort of the motivation for why do we need to uh, study the particular problem of numerical methods. So course topics are as follows. <coughs> We're going to start with linear algebra review. Now before I question, so how many of you have had 
the linear algebra of the math classes. Not for me. Are you possibly now in a class that is only used in your ordinary, that's going to have ordinary differential equations in it? Math for this level of say or something like that? Then you're now in that class. So we're either going in parallel. I don't know how we, where the linear algebra will be in that class, maybe at the beginning, maybe not. So regardless, we're going to do a relative equation for you. Yeah. And basic, basic problems that we're working with is matrix operations, because a lot of data is stored as matrices and that we have to know how to operate them. Then we are going to move on with MATLAB fundamentals. So that's basically going to be programming fundamentals, but we're going to implement them in that class. Again, that said, the choice of environment is relatively open. Right now, which is one of the most used languages out there? What does it mean? Java is pretty common in that sense. C is pretty common in solution to the seriously and technically involved problems, but one of the most rising uh, here, languages right now is Python. Now Python for numerical methods is actually not the fastest for numerical methods in themselves. It's certainly way faster, way faster than that one. But it's very good in communication and moving the data around, which is very important these days. Has anybody heard the buzzword big data? So for instance, Facebook is gathering all of the all of the content that they have about us. Our photos, our birthdays, our communication links, uh, what it is that we are browsing while we're on Facebook, all of that. Okay? That's a lot of data. Okay? That data has to be explored, and Python is one of the languages. So you will hear about Python, and actually we are discussing right now in, uh, in the department whether this class should be Python, and we'll possibly study it all in fall, it will be. Okay. But the whole point I'm making is that programming languages is something that changes, but there is certain programming structure that doesn't, and we're actually going to learn that programming structure. So even down the line, you have to learn a different programming language, it's not a big deal. All of them have certain common things that you should be able to pick up and learn, which is relatively easy. So ultimately, how I learned, and the one that I learned back in the day, back, back in the day, called Pascal, doesn't exist for me anymore. Doesn't matter. I learned the programming structure. So uh, <coughs> I'm going to go through MATLAB fundamentals and programming, and then one of the sort of the 90% of the time, 10% of the time you spend writing the program, the rest of the time you spend finding the problems in your program, and that's called errors and debugging. So we're going to go over that. And then this is actually where the numerical methods actually start. So we will find methods to define root finding, solve systems of linear equations, curve fitting, some numerical interpolation if time permits. Most often, but not, time doesn't permit, and then numerical calculus and ordinary differential equations. My computer wants to com communicate with me. As I mentioned, course materials will be posted after each lecture, including PowerPoints and this recording. There's a textbook if you'd like to buy one, but you're not required to purchase it. Uh, the lecture style will be a combination of this traditional lecture, problem solving and holding, coding in class, which is why it's important that you have your laptop with you, and also assigned reading and or watching material before the class so we can discuss and do more hands-on problems in class. The software will be MATLAB, and I'm going to actually, so these are just installation, installation instructions that are posted here in slides for you. I'm going to email them. So in the next coming weeks, I'm going to send you an email. So please, if you don't have your laptops right now necessarily, so that your own time, please install. That one is free for uh, YouTube students. But you have to register it with your UT, uh, UTE laptops. It will be registered with this one in August. 
that's one thing. There's also an alternative to MATLAB. So for some reason, three years from now, you don't have access to MATLAB anymore because you're not using the student. There's a free version called and most of the functionality is there, especially for things that you're going to work on. So there is a free option to MATLAB if you uh, don't have it. And we will need some calculators, in which case I don't want you to use the programmable or graphing calculators. It's going to be mostly important for uh, exams because if you're not an exam, you have MATLAB, which is actually a glorified calculator. <laughs> I don't think I use calculators anymore. For the simple calculator, I actually type into, you can type into Google these days, the basic operations. And for everything else, I actually open MATLAB and so that's a very nice uh, graphing interface and so forth. So calculator is a bit, and these are the installation details. If you're asked when you're installing, just install everything, don't worry about it. Alternative is a TIV. This is the information if you would like to use uh, the alternative. Is there a difference in quality? Yes, some. Uh, MATLAB is paid for, therefore the, it's going to run a little smoother. Yeah, because there is paid into the source limit. Alternative is done by basically people donating their time. Okay. Now that said, for all of the functions that we use, both should work rather well. Okay. Now, <coughs> let's just uh, resolve one thing. So most of you are in engineering program. What is the difference between scientists and what the scientists do versus what the engineers do? So basic science classes versus An engineering class is just a class that builds something and something like that. So what is the basic difference? The science works with fundamentals. How the laws of nature work. Whether you're not whether or not you apply them to do something, it doesn't matter. You just isolate what you want to study, how does certain reaction work? Now, if I'm a controlling engineer, I'm interested in how can that reaction help me to extract the problem. How can that reaction help me descale my level more so I can actually move forward? So I'm going to apply for apply the basically fundamentals. So there's uh, there's a F fundamental difference in approach. So scientists, they seek to understand nature and isolate a single portion of it and study and understand it in detail. So the research results are fundamental in nature. Whether, whereas engineers, they design and build things that work with those fundamental laws and they need to find which laws are important and which can be also neglected in certain circumstances. So basically, I need to pre predict the behavior of the system and figure out what's going to impact me the most. So here is an example of where it's important to isolate what's going to be impacting me the most. I love my coffee in the morning. And if I take my coffee, there's no more sugar. And if I put that sugar, it's going to fall on the bottom of the cup. Is that sugar going to spread all right on the other side? There's some laws that say, yes, there's a concentration difference. So that concentration, if my sugar is very well concentrated on the bottom, it should somehow get to the top. Because there's, a there's a concentration difference there. Is it going to happen though? No, because it has to fight gravity. Gravity takes over. So there are those, both are in place. I have a concentration difference, but I also have gravity. I have to figure out which one is actually more important. So I have to come in with a spoon 
and add some mechanical en energy to the system to actually stir it up and mix it. So I had to add convection motion to actually mix it up. Okay. Because the mass transport on its own is not going to do its thing in the present. So this is where we know all of the laws. We can possibly study them in an isolated way. But as an engineer, I have to know well, which one is actually going to take over so I can solve the problem. Because ultimately, I'm going to be an engineer and take this thing and make it happen. Okay. So this is sort of the difference in applications. Now, <coughs> petroleum engineers, they deal with some of the most complicated uh, situations and are distinctly different in the sense that they don't design their system. Electrical engineer designs the chain. We have a reservoir. The reservoir is what is. The only thing we are really interested in is that there is oil in there. But we haven't designed the reservoir. We have the work that the reservoir is given, we investigate it, and we solve the problem. And all of that is typically happened at great depths. Some of the uh, longest, I think Sakhalin was one of the offshore, offshore wells in Russia that has been uh, built recently. I think it goes 10 kilometers down, 15 kilometers for a long time. 15 kilometers. And you're the one that's flowing oil, 25 kilometers of so obviously transport that happens, it happens at great depth, great pressures, great temperatures, so you have to know um, what is happening. So all of that is way easier if we have multiple tools to build our knowledge to solve the problems with. We typically have three tools at our disposal, and there's actually hints here what are the base, basic three tools to build either science or One is Einstein's was very important in the board. He was the master of equations of theory. Okay. Second one is I have some setup there measuring something. What is that? Experiments. And third one is some sort of grid. This is actually a reservoir. Third one is numerical. I'll see you on Friday.